Hello, this is Harlan. Welcome to my class, Beginning Needle Felting. In this class, we will cover choosing your work surface, proper needling, firmness, and we will be making a hedgehog pincushion. To make the hedgehog pincushion, you will need the following materials. Core fiber or a white fiber, black fiber, a novelty fiber in brown or gray, Shetland, Romney, or another textured fiber will do. I am using a Shetland fiber. Felting needles, two black glass beads, size E, needle and thread. It really isn't necessary for you to actually make the projects I will be using to teach needling and firmness, but should you wish to, the materials you will need are core fiber or a white fiber if you have no core fiber, two or three brightly colored fibers, a new blade or razor blade, and needles, number 36, number 38 star, and number 42s. Multiple needle tools always make needle felting work go faster, but you can do these projects with single needles. The tools you will see in the photos in this broadcast are my own tools. Always remember that felting needles are very sharp. Handle them with care. Choosing your work surface is one of the most important decisions you will make when you take up needle felting. Many needle felters choose a thick foam pad, similar to the one on the left. They are inexpensive and easy to find. Often felters will cover these pads with flannel or fleece. The thickness of the pad allows you to insert the felting needles through the fiber and into the foam pad below. There's no damage to the needles. The disadvantage of a foam pad is it gives. That give in the foam pad contributes to repetitive motion disorder. Over time, repetitive piercing of the foam pad with the felting needles will cause it to begin to break down and it will need to be replaced. While you may be able to work on one foam pad for a long time, it will need to be replaced. This is the clover brush mat. It is constructed of closely packed bristles. Many needle felters believe that the brush mat is just for flat felting. It works perfectly well for sculptural needle felting. Felting needles slip between the bristles in the mat. This action causes no damage to the needles or to the bristles. The bristles do not give under the force of needling. The mat eliminates the additional movement caused by the give of a foam pad and thus reduces the risk of repetitive motion disorder. Plus, it makes every thrust of the needle more effective. The only disadvantage to a clover brush mat is the bristles will grab fiber. A good solution is to cover the mat with a piece of flannel. I've tried many types of fabric but find that flannel works best. This flannel will break down over time and it will need to be replaced, but that is still less expensive than replacing a foam pad and its fabric cover. Even with the use of a flannel cover, fibers will become lodged in the bristles. That can actually be advantageous should you need to pin a sculptural piece in place for detail work. The fibers in the mat help to hold the securing pins in place. Cleaning the brush mat is easily accomplished by inserting a thin knitting needle or similar object along the bottom of the rows of bristles and then lifting up. I've worked extensively on both foam pads and the clover brush mat. I replaced my foam pad several times within a half a year. I've been working on the same brush mat for more than a couple years now. It is still as useful a work surface as the day I brought it home. It doesn't look as pristine as the one in this photograph, but it works just as well. If you are a beginning needle felter, you may not wish to invest in the clover brush mat, but if you get serious about this craft, 
I urge you to buy a large clover brush mat. It may seem that how to use the felting needles is self-explanatory. You stick the needle in, you pull it out. What's difficult about that? In practice, I have learned that many beginner needle felters do not use their needles properly. It really isn't necessary for you to actually make the projects I will be using to teach needling, but should you wish to, the materials you will need are core fiber, or a white fiber if you have no core fiber, two or three brightly colored fibers, a new blade or razor blade, and needles number six, number 38 star, and number 42s. Multiple needle tools always make needle felting work go faster, but you can do these projects with single needles. The tools you will see in the photos of this broadcast are my own tools. Always remember that felting needles are very sharp. Handle them with care. Core fiber is less expensive than the fibers generally used for needle felting. Core fiber is used to occupy the space inside a needle felted object. It is usually not drummed to align the fibers, which means the fibers are somewhat tangled, which is halfway to felted. Core fiber can save you money and time. If you do not have any core fiber, you can use a white fiber. Fold over one third of the length and tack it down with your needles to hold it in place. Fold over the other third to make a nice thick pile of fiber. Use your needles to tack the ends in place. It really does look like a blob at this stage, but think cube or brick. We want a six-sided object. I will continue to call it a cube. Needle the sides, needle the top and bottom. Don't rush the process. Work slowly and evenly. Now that blob of fiber is beginning to take some recognizable shape, it's still very soft and not well felted at this stage, so we have a lot more needling to do. Continue needling all six sides. Ultimately, it isn't important that all the sides are exactly the same width. To make this easier to understand, I will call this area the face. There is the one you can see facing us in the photo and its mate at the back. The remaining four sides I will continue to call sides. By continuing to uniformly felt all four sides and the two faces, our blob, now really looks more like a cube. Our cube has been reduced by almost an inch in length. The cube is still very soft and easy to compress with just light pressure from my finger. We want it firmer than that, so back to felting. Work the four sides slightly more than the two faces of our cube. If you needle too much on the faces, our cube will lose thickness that we want to keep. When you are reducing the size of an object, you can control its shape by needling some areas more than other areas. There really is a lot of work involved in creating one of these firm cubes. Now we're ready to put it to some very good use. Finally, we can get to some color. Take a hold of your length of fiber in one hand and pull at the loose ends to tear off some shorter lengths of fiber. Place that fiber on one side of our cube. Stick your number 36 or number 38 star needle perpendicular to the surface. You want the whole of the angular tip, which has the barbs, to completely enter the cube. Needling perpendicular to the core or center of your object is deep needling. If you lift your needle slightly and then jab it back into the core without removing it completely, you are needling in place. Every time you thrust your needle, the barbs grab different fibers and assist the felting process. This process goes faster with multiple needle tools. 
Continue to thrust your needle straight into the core, especially along the middle of the side. Yes, indeed, we are going to cut this in two. Here you can see how the color fiber has been thrust straight down into the core fiber. This is what deep needling is doing inside your piece. We're not done yet. I've made another cube. This one ended up being larger than the last. And rather than make a third cube later, I'm just going to cut this one in half. Tear off some fiber as we did before and place it on one half of the side. Thrust the needle in at a 45 degree angle. Do this many times, especially along the middle. Needle in place as well. Needling in place is always good needling. Needle this color until it is well felted into the cube. Remember to needle always at that 45 degree angle. I've turned our cube around and added new fiber. Being right-handed, I needle from the right. Thrust the needle in deeply and felt the second color well into the cube at the same 45 degree angle. Now that that's done, we'll cut it in half. This is cross needling. You can see how the green fibers from the right have been moved by the barbs to the left side of our cube and the orange fibers on the left have been moved to the right. Cross needling helps to distribute fibers in a wider range of directions within an object than does deep needling. Tear off some fiber and place it on top of the last cube section. Here we're going to needle at a very shallow angle to our surface. Pictured is my four needle tool fitted with number 42 needles. You can use any size needle at this stage when you are just beginning to felt surface fiber to the core below. I'm using number 42 needles because they are extremely useful for surface finishing. When you are felting at shallow angles, you want to hold your needles so that the first barb on the tip is the first barb to enter the fiber. This is a number 42 needle. The first barb on a number 42 is here, on the back side of the L of the needle. In all the following photographs, my needles are positioned so that first barb enters the fiber first and does the most amount of work. The first barb is not always on the back side of the L. It is on number 42 needles. So know where your barbs are located. Felt at this very shallow angle from one end to the other end. Continue to felt the surface at this very shallow angle from all different directions and then do it again. Felting at very shallow angles repeatedly not only secures the surface fiber to the core fiber below but catches and felts down the flyaway fibers that are often the bane of needle felters. That looks nicely felted, so let's cut it in half. This is called surface felting. It has many uses, but is especially good for giving a piece a fine, smooth finish when worked with number 42 needles. Deep needling, cross needling, surface needling, these are your most important ways to needle, and all of them can be combined with needle in place. These needling techniques help to felt objects more firmly and uniformly. They are always useful, but especially important when you are applying surface fiber, our colored fiber, over a core fiber. But wait, there's more. I've made an egg. I started with a blob of fiber, not unlike that which we used to make the cube. I just made it egg shape. Once I established my egg shape, I reduced its size by uniformly needling until it is a fairly firm little egg. 
working your needles in all one particular direction while rotating the object to work evenly is called directional needling. It has allowed me to create a tip where none existed before. You've learned deep needling, cross needling, surface needling, needle in place, and directional needling. Remember to use the full work area of your needles. That's where the barbs are. There are only a few times when needle felting when you would not insert the full working length of your needles, but I'll get to that in another lesson. This concludes part one of beginning needle felting. I hope you found the information useful. The beginning needle felting class continues in part two, where we will cover the subject of firmness in needle felting. For Craft EDU, this is Harlan. Hello, this is Harlan. Welcome to part two of beginning needle felting. In this section, we will be learning about firmness in needle felting. It isn't necessary for you to make the objects you will see in this broadcast, but should you wish to, you will need some core fiber, some color fiber, needles, a new blade, or a razor. Trying to describe firmness accurately is a daunting task. It would be far easier if I could just hand you a needle felted object and let you examine it, squeeze it, feel its weight comparative to its size. Since I am unable to do that, I have to resort to more creative approach. Let's start by making an object to demonstrate firmness. Here I have some core fiber which I've torn off into a section approximately 8 inches by 15 inches. I've rolled up the fiber and secured it with my needles. It is approximately 8 inches long. The log is a little over 3 inches in diameter. It is very unfirm. I've done almost no needling to this log, save to tack the ends in to secure them. In the second photo, I have done some needling. The general rule with needling is to needle uniformly over the entire object. You can see by this photo that the diameter of the log has been reduced by approximately a half an inch. I have added some surface fiber, which I call dress fiber, and needled the whole log again. There has been no significant reduction in the size of our log here because of this additional fiber. I needled the log some more, and yes, I really did cut off a section. The log and the section are the same firmness. This section is still very soft. I've reduced the log again. The diameter has been reduced to about two inches and I've cut off another section. This section is still fairly soft. Every time I reduce the size of the log, I am increasing the firmness. This section is firmer than the previous two sections, but it is still fairly soft. The log is getting firmer Notice that each time I reduce the log, more dress fiber is visible in the middle of each section. This section is firmer than the last. There is still some give, but it is beginning to feel solid. My last section is firmer still. It is very dense and heavy for its size. There is still a little bit of give. I could reduce the log yet again but doing so would take considerably more effort. The firmer an object becomes, the more difficult it is to needle. We've looked at six sections of increasing firmness. Which do you think is the ideal firmness? The first soft section, which has a lot of give. 
the second, which was still very soft, the third, which was beginning to feel firm, the fourth section, which was firmer still. Maybe you think it's the fifth section. Or perhaps you think the ideal firmness is the firmness of the last section. How firm your object should be really depends on what you are making. Some objects do not need to be very firm. A pin cushion or a dryer ball are fine in a soft firmness. But if you were making a focal bead or a cat toy, you would want the object very firm to withstand the treatment it is likely to receive. Medium firmness works best when constructing complex sculptural objects. The construction process will increase the firmness. It is best to start with parts that are medium firm. Why? Medium firm objects are very plastic. Medium firm objects are easier to manipulate than very firm objects. Let me demonstrate with a couple of examples. First, we need to create an object, so we'll take some fiber. I've made a tapered log of medium firmness. When an object is medium firm, it is possible to manipulate it just with the pressure of your hands and fingertips. Rolling this log in my hands made it longer. Notice as I elongate the log, it is getting longer and narrower. There is a lot we can do with this log with the use of our hands and needles. We can flatten the sides. We can twist it and secure that twist in place by needling. We can bend it. We can bend it more with the use of our fingers and bend it even more and secure the bend with needling. Let's look at another example. Here I've made a carrot shape. I can roll it up into the shape of a shell and needle so that it remains rolled up. I can refine that shape and reduce the overall size, which will also increase the firmness. I can create ridges. With further reduction, I could add many more details. Medium firmness allows you to make changes, to make adjustments, to control your fiber, manipulations that would not be possible with an object that is very firm. This shell was embellished when it was medium firm. If the shell had been extremely firm, it would have been more difficult to add the embellishments and properly felt them into the hole. After the embellishments were added, everything was reduced to increase the overall firmness. These legs were created at medium firmness and then the feet, ankles, knees, hips were defined. Additional fiber was then added to increase the firmness without loss of size to the legs. The legs need to be very firm to support the weight of the body. How firm an object should be is determined by its purpose. If you felt too firmly, it becomes difficult to manipulate and to properly add new elements. There should always be a little bit of give. This is fiber after all. There is no need to make it feel like a rock. I hope this lesson has explained the significance of controlling your firmness in needle felting. In general with needle felting, you want to keep objects uniformly firm, but there are times when it is advantageous to have variable firmness, but I will save that for another lesson. This concludes part two of beginning needle felting. 
In part three, we will be making a hedgehog pincushion. For Crafty to You, this is Harlan. Hello, this is Harlan. Welcome to part three of Beginning Needle Felting. In this part, we will be making a hedgehog pincushion. Here's the little guy we will be making. In the construction of this pincushion, we will be making use of proper needling, which you learned in part one of this series, and firmness, which you learned in part two. If you would like to review the information of those parts, simply click on the appropriate link. To make the hedgehog pincushion, you will need the following materials. Core fiber or a white fiber, black fiber, a novelty fiber in brown or gray, Shetland, Romney, or another textured fiber will do. I am using a Shetland fiber. Felting needles, two black glass beads, size E, needle and thread. I am using wool batting from the Frankenmuth Woolen Mills as my core fiber. Because this fiber has been processed for batting, it is easy to tear off in measurable chunks. This chunk is about 3 to 4 inches wide and a foot long. If you do not have any such core fiber available, you can use a white fiber. You should take a hold of your white fiber and tear off short lengths from the end. Roll up the core fiber to form a log. If you are working with white fiber, gather the torn off short lengths of fiber into a rough log larger than you want your finished pincushion to be. You do not want to simply take your white fiber and roll it up as I did the wool batting. Most of the fiber easily available to needle felters has been drummed which aligns the fibers to run parallel to one another. A lined fiber does not felt as easily as does fiber that is unaligned. By tearing off short lengths and gathering those lengths into a rough log shape, you break the alignment and make felting easier. Begin needling your log. Because we want our hedgehog pincushion to have a flat bottom, you will not need to rotate your log while needling. Simply leave it on your work surface and needle the top and sides. Do not over needle. Our fiber should be of a very soft firmness for these steps. We do want to form a teardrop shape. To do that, choose one end to be the point of the teardrop and needle that end more than the rest of the fiber. Work slowly. As you become more experienced with needle felting, you will be able to work faster, but there are steps that even I do slowly and carefully. From time to time, do lift the fiber and needle the bottom. Place it back upon the work surface and continue to refine the teardrop shape. Our hedgehog pincushion will have variable firmness. The head, snout area, will be firmer to allow us later to define facial features. And the body will be softly felted to make it ideal for holding pins. Needle the snout area to reduce its size and increase its firmness. Do rotate the whole body to refine and reduce the snout area. Check the firmness of your snout by compressing it between your fingers. If it is still very soft, as it is in this photo, add fiber and needle that into your snout. We want the snout to be of medium or greater firmness. Continue to check the firmness of the snout and adding fiber as needed. By increasing firmness in the snout, we are reducing size. So you add fiber to maintain the teardrop shape as well as to control the firmness. It's time to look at the bottom of our pincushion again. You may notice that the bottom has taken on a cupped shape. 
This is the result of needling primarily from the top and sides. Every thrust of the needles felts and tangles the fiber. The needles have actually lifted the fiber from the bottom. To correct the cupped bottom, add more fiber and felt that into place. Keep in mind that we do not want the body to get too firm, so do not over needle. Now it is time to define a head ridge on our hedgehog. We do this by placing our hand behind the area we intend to needle. Always be very careful when needling towards your hand. The hand holds the fiber in place and to resist the force of the needles. As the needles enter the fiber, the hand pushes the fiber towards the needles. This helps to form a ridge. Create this ridge in a semicircle between snout and body. Once you have established the head ridge, you can further define it with just your needles. We're making good progress. We've defined a firm snout area, a head ridge, and a nice softly felted body. This is a good time to look the piece over and see if any corrections are necessary. Needle or add fiber and needle until you are pleased with the overall shape. Don't over needle that body. Let's make some legs. To make a leg you will need a small amount of fiber. I've laid out a thin layer of fiber about an inch wide and three inches long. If you are using white drummed fiber, tear off some fiber from the ends and lay it out similarly to the core fiber I have used. Begin rolling the fiber up into a cylinder. We're not going to make super defined legs for our hedgehog. Begin needling the cylinder, but only at one end. We want to felt and firm one end of our cylinder while leaving the other end untouched. Remember to rotate your cylinder while felting. Doing so will define our legs and provide us with loose fiber to attach the legs to the body. These legs will not be supporting any weight, so they do not need to be very firm. They just need to look nice. There, we've made one leg. It's about medium firmness and has a nice tapered end. These loose fibers will be used later to felt the leg to the body. When you are making such small objects, you can sometimes find you have too much or too little fiber where you are working. You can use your needles to correct such problems with directional needling. Too much fiber in the leg? Force some of the fiber out to become part of the fiber that will be attached to the body. Not enough fiber in the leg? Force some of the loose fiber into the leg. You will need to make three more legs and a tail. The tail is just a smaller version of the legs. You may notice that all these legs are not precisely the same length. It is only important that all the felted portions be of similar size. The extra length and loose fiber will disappear when the legs are felted to the body. Those loose fibers we left when making our legs will now assist us to felt the legs to the body. Felt all around the leg to secure it firmly. Purpose determines method. This is a pin cushion, so it is unlikely that anyone will ever be swinging our hedgehog around their head by its leg. So we want to secure the leg so that it is not obvious where it has been joined and will stay in place when gently tugged, but we don't need to spend a lot of energy needling the leg to the body. Attach the other legs and the tail. This is a good time to stop and look over the project and see if there are any adjustments to be made. Take your textured fiber and lay it in place. We're looking to see how it will look and how it fits the hedgehog form we have made. I'm using a Shetland fiber and it isn't quite long enough to reach from the head ridge to the tail. The obvious solution is to add more of the textured fiber, but as you can see in my fiber, 
one end has been sun bleached. If I were to add the fiber in this orientation, it would be very obvious. But by turning that additional fiber around, I am joining parts of the fiber that look most like one another. Once felted, you will be unable to tell where I added fiber. It's time to start attaching the textured fiber to the body. We're only doing light felting here. We do want to attach it well to the underlying body of the hedgehog, but we do not want to felt away the texture of this fiber. We're using a textured fiber to serve as the spines of our hedgehog. We want to condense the length of this first portion of our textured fiber between the head ridge and about the middle of the body. Add the rest of the textured fiber and felt it well, but lightly, to the body. Because we took the time to examine our textured fiber and decide which was the best way to add additional fiber, it is impossible to tell precisely where that fiber was added. You might be quite pleased with our little hedgehog as he is now. He'd make an excellent pincushion, but we're going to do some more work on his face. To prepare for additional work on the face, we're going to create a nose. To do this, tear off some black fiber. You won't need a lot. Gather it up into a ball. You may find that you can begin the ball shape by rolling the fibers between your palms. With very small quantities of fiber, this is not always effective. Or you can just start needling, rolling and needling, rolling and needling until you have a nice ball shape. Check to see that your nose is the correct size for your snout. If it is too small, add some fiber. If it is too large, needle it some more. Once you have a nose that is the correct size, attach the nose to the tip of the snout, needle all around the nose, so that it is well attached. Tear off a small quantity of fiber from your textured fiber. Use some of the fiber around the snout right next to the nose and some fiber where the eyes will be placed. Thread your needle with some black thread. The doubled thread should be about a foot long, not both ends together. Insert your needle from one eye area to the other eye area. Pull your thread through, but do not pull the knot tightly to the surface of the face. Pick up one of your glass beads on the needle and pass the needle back to the other side. Pass your needle between the threads near the knot and pull all slack out of your thread. You do this to assure that the thread will be securely held in place. Add the other glass bead and insert your needle to the other side. If you apply increased tension on your thread at this point, you can cause the eyes to become slightly indented into the face. You can knot and cut your thread or you can bury your thread by passing it back and forth a couple times between the two sides and then cutting it. Very nice eyes, but he needs some ears now too. Take a small quantity of your textured fiber, about one inch wide, and lay it on your work surface. As when we made the legs, there will be loose fiber that will not be felted in the process of making the ears. Using your needles, felt and shape the ear by gently folding in the edges to form a nice rounded edge. Lift the ear and turn it over and felt from the other side. Do this several times until the ear is well felted. Make a matching ear. Fold the ear in half and needle. Now attach the ears to the hedgehog. Needle the loose fiber of the ear well into the body and blend it into the textured fiber already attached to the body. Well done! What a nice hedgehog pincushion! My husband named this hedgehog 
halberd. The thick body is ideal for pins, but actually too thick for needles, which might get lost in its depth. The snout area works perfectly for needles. Thank you for taking my class in beginning needle felting. I hope you found this class informative and interesting and are inspired to continue learning about needle felting. For Crafty DU, this is Harlan.